I think this is the most important issue that we need to be talking about. Climate change is here now and it is killing people. The next eight to 10 years is going to determine the quality of life for the next 100 to 200 years. Young people from all over the world took to the streets to express their feeling that we're not doing enough about climate change. Today we take a stand for nature. We're not treating it like the emergency it is. This cannot go on. You know it, I know it, and we know what we need to do. The climate crisis is an opportunity. The passion for protest can turn into a passion for changing all of our behavior to create a better, safer, just, sustainable world. I'm so pleased to be joined by Richard Curtis, a writer and director that you all know from his many films, including Four Weddings and a Funeral, Bridget Jones' Diary, Love Actually, many, many others, for our audience, he might be even better known as the co-founder of charity Comic Relief UK and USA, as a founding member of Make Poverty History, one of the minds behind Live 8 in 2005, as well as a long list of other very successful campaigns increasingly oriented towards the sustainable development goals. Richard, it's wonderful to have you here with us at DevX World. It's great to be here. I'm very glad I remembered my badge. <laughs> so are we. So speaking of the badge, you are an official SDG advocate, a fierce defender of the spirit of optimism that characterizes the global goals. 2020 has been a challenging year for optimists. We've seen projections that COVID is likely to reverse many of the gains made against poverty and fighting disease. And that comes at a time when the SDGs already represented a very ambitious set of aspirations. I think your work on the Nations United film that we just saw part of um, speaks to this, but as you continue to build support for this agenda, do you anticipate your message will have to change in light of how much more challenging it will be to meet these goals in a COVID and post COVID world? Well, uh, I mean, I am quite optimistic by nature and I do think that the SDGs are the answer, you know, in a funny way, no matter what occurs, the fact that there's, they're there, the fact there is this roadmap, the fact that there is this plan becomes more important than ever. Uh, I mean, COVID has been such a huge tragedy, but one of the things I, th I feel it's done is shown that very bad big things can happen. You know, I think the way Manhattan was overtaken by the disease suddenly makes the possibility that Manhattan may flood one day seem like a realistic thing that we should be worried and working for. So I'm hoping that the goals become more useful, more looked to as an answer. Uh, the businesses focus on sustainability more than ever. Um, so in some ways it increases my, you know, fervor for the mission, despite the, you know, the, as you say, the, great worries about the knocks that COVID will have caused. Do you think people are able to, to project into the future and to imagine sort of that, um, that more desirable reality that the SDGs represent um, at a moment when, you know, so many of us are, are sort of consumed by the challenges of life under lockdown or, or quarantine? Is it more difficult to communicate a hopeful vision at a, a challenging moment of crisis? I don't, I don't know that it is. I mean, I think one of the, it'd be interesting how we're feeling now, but certainly in the UK, you know, that sense of com community was actually increased. That sense of people coming together, suddenly realizing the incredible importance of the NHS and of, you know, all the people who work in what appear to be less important jobs, but are in fact completely the most important jobs. So I think to some extent, people are open to that. And I do think there's a there is a sort of counter narrative to this year, which is the rise in an acceleration of big popular movements. I mean, I've certainly never known a year like this in terms of Me Too and the Women's March, Black Lives Matter, the, you know, the Friday for climate strikes. And so I think that there's also a sense that there's this public energy that's demanding big, fast action, and that these are things that everybody feels rather than we're just ticking along in an average year. 
So I'm hoping that that will be a springboard towards a decade of action rather than, and I think by the way, because the SDGs are there, it could be that people, that there is a real increase in enthusiasm for sustainability, particularly in investment and in business, which might have just trickled along and never made it up to the boardroom. So, you know, I think we should leap on the chance while we can. That public mobilization and um, movement building uh, is an incredible thing to see. I wonder if you uh, see that being matched by the political will that will also be necessary to achieve these goals. And I ask that sort of in the context of one of the really big stories that we've been covering at, at DevEx, which is the UK government's decision to back away from its legal commitment to providing 0.7% of gross national income as development assistance. You've often spoken proudly about the UK as a, a global development leader. Are you worried it won't be one in the future? Well, look, I'm very, um, <clears throat> you know, very sad about that decision, which I think is not only sort of morally the wrong decision, but actually sort of structurally, go globally, financially, if you don't have countries, um, you know, thriving, particularly across Africa, then you won't have the economic benefits that would come from, uh, you know, the poor countries being wealthier. So I think it's, that's been a sad thing. Look, it's always a battle to and fro at exactly the same moment that was happening. Joe Biden was elected president and, you know, and last America is really starting to talk seriously about climate. So there will be wins and there will be losses. But I think that the feeling of, you know, the public mood changing on issues, and I think particularly interestingly, you know, business changing on a lot of these issues, um, you know, does lead me to be hopeful. And we're at a really interesting point for the SDGs. These are the kind of, you know, middle act. Uh, I really think that if we can keep them strongly alive the last five years, there'll be an unbelievable driver for change because of the deadline. And this is the time when you put all the pieces in place. So I think that, you know, there are, there are good political things and there are bad political things and there always will be. Um, but I'm hoping that the SDGs will mean that more and more governments take these broader issues into account, you know, with their big decisions. And you're a person with sort of power and platform to influence that public mood. I mean, whether it's on sort of specific questions of, of UK leadership on aid or, or bigger questions about building support for the SDGs, how do you think about the role of artists and cultural leaders to influence sort of the politics or the, the public opinion around issues of global cooperation for development? How do you see your role and, and the role of those that you collaborate and sort of bring to the table? Well, it's all, I think it's always been an important issue. I've learned more about, you know, poverty in the UK from the films of Ken Loach than I have from every single TV program I've ever watched or every newspaper I've ever read. And, you know, the reason I became involved in any of this was because of a cultural event, because of Live Aid. Um, in 1985. So um, I, I think it's very important. I actually think, strangely, I'm very interested in the power of marketeers at the moment. You know, I think that as you see businesses taking sustainable things more seriously, I really want them to have the confidence to say to the public, this is what we're doing. I do think there is a kind of consumer revolution happening where people are saying, you know, the clothes I buy, the pension I take out, the way I travel, all of these lifestyle changes are things which really I think are going to appeal to people if they're marketed. So I think it's really important as well that people who are doing the right thing make a noise about it and make sure that it's clear to the public that every bit of action they take, uh, you know, is something that really could have a really beneficial thing. So. I think it's at every point, you know, it's really important to make inspiring and passionate films. It's great, the rise of the documentary now, which is meaning that, you know, I watched that film 13, which really, you know, knocks into the issue of race in America so beautifully. But then if you're a creative person who's drawing an ad for Unilever, you know, stick the SDGs on it because it's really important. Everyone knows all the things that Unilever are doing. Comic Relief, the, the charity that you co-founded, which has 
at this point raised well over 1 billion pounds uh, over the last 35. What is the total now? Do you, I mean, it must be. I think it's uh, over 1.3 billion pounds now. Yeah. OK. Um, the charity announced a couple months ago that it will stop sending celebrities to Africa and stop using photos of people who are ill or starving in its fundraising. How did the organization come to that decision? And what do you think is the storytelling model or narrative that should replace that sort of quote unquote white savior tropes of the past? Well, um, you know, there really is a, the comic relief grant making has so focused on shifting the power to the South. I mean, I'm talking about our international grants that, uh, you know, you more and more want the people who really know about the subject and are really benefiting to be the ones who tell their story and explain because you can smell the truth rather than someone who's just rocked up a couple of days ago. I mean, it is a challenge. Uh, as things change, there are challenges. You know, we know that a famous person and, and, and uh, you know, experiencing the emotion of first experiencing those things can be a very powerful identifying factor. But we just have to, you know, focus on new things. The specificity of what your money can achieve uh, is really, really important. The joy, the actual joy of results has always been a way of getting people to give money. So it just became such a sensitive issue and uh, something where we wanted to take the lead rather than as it were saying, well, we'll do a bit less or we'll do a little bit more. Um, you know, I do think, I, I do notice the world changing fast and I, I hate the idea that people would just hold to their old positions. So when I look at my film Love Actually, you know, that there's not enough diversity in the casting. I just accept that now. If I were making that film now, it would have a completely different flavor. And I don't want to spend my time saying, oh yeah, but you know, at the time it was this. It's much more important to think the next project I do, how can we spin it around? How can we, how can we change it? And there are so many exciting things, you know, to take advantage of. When I talk about, you know, so much of my children's conversation is dominated by talk of, you know, equality and talk of gender and talk of climate. Why would you not write things that appeal to their passions? They, they're much more concerned about those than they are about Hugh Grant's haircut. <laughs> I suppose that's a that's a hopeful note. He's hardly uh, got any hair left now, so. <laughs> um, I can't really comment on that. <laughs> um, what is one thing that you think most people misunderstand about fundraising campaigns for humanitarian and, and development issues? What is something beyond the sort of communications work that you do for the issues that sell themselves? What would you communicate to other potential fundraisers who, who want to do this work better? Wow, I mean, that's a very interesting question. Um, I mean, I think, you know, I think one thing which really is interesting now is the power of movements, you know, and that's quite a difficult thing to communicate. But the fact that if you want laws on FGM changed, you know, if you want land rights insisted on, if you, that these are, you know, they haven't got the same, <clears throat> they haven't got the same quid pro quo. They aren't, um, you know, the, they aren't the malaria net. Uh, but on the other hand, I do think that young people are open to different messages. The first time my son who's grown up with Red Nose Day, you know, charged downstairs to me, he said, I'd given 200 pounds to this thing called Kiva that's going to lend that money to a woman setting up a business in Uganda, and I'm going to get the money back. And I think people are getting very interested in the idea of giving directly to people. You know, you sort of got to trust that rather going through an agency, if you give money directly to somebody, they'll spend it on the thing that they most need, not the thing that they're told that they most need. So I think the thing to do is just look out for fresh things that excite and interest you. You know, go through the things that your charity is doing and see whether or not you can come up with a new idea. I'm obsessed by the fact that Help Refugees, which is a brilliant charity doing extraordinary work on the ground, chose as their slogan, choose love. So the first thing they said was, this is fundamentally an act of human love, not looking at some refugees and feeling sorry for them and thinking that's awful, but saying, I'm gonna, before I even look at that, 
I'm going to have taken up a moral humanitarian position. So I think it's, you know, being open to fresh things. And, you know, that's what we're trying to do with the SDGs every day. We're trying to say new things about them. We're trying to say they're a great plan, but we're trying to say that whatever you care about, whether it's women or whether it's corruption or whether or not it's business or climate, these things are important to you and stress different ones of those at different times. So I think it's just a question of looking at what's the truth and not always talking about the same tiny bit of that truth. One final question, again, related to current events. I've read that you only rewatch Love Actually every five years or so, uh -huh. uh, which is difficult for me to comprehend based on the experience in my own household. I was just wondering, as the film's Fine. creator, are you immune to its powers? Um, and is there another film that sort of feeds your holiday movie addiction in a way that one does for much of the population? I'm so glad you asked that question because I'm obsessed by Elf. Um, that's the film that I think that everyone should switch off love actually watch Elf again. Uh, that's my feeling. Um, no, I mean, look, it's funny. You've just made our headline. What's that? I believe you, you've just written our headline, I believe, from the segment. Um, no, look, I think that I, no, I, I, I like love actually because I, I do believe that and I do believe that people <clears throat> underestimate the power of love as a force. You know, they often think the world is full of serial killers and it isn't. The world is full of people trying to do their best um, for their families. But it's very odd for me watching Love actually because it just looks like an expensive diary now. You know, I say Colin Firth didn't like his costume that day and we ran out of time and that's why we had to shoot it that way. And, oh, I wish I hadn't written that line, you know. So it is hard for me to watch it. Richard, it's been fantastic talking with you and thanks so much for your work and for joining us today. It's been, it's been really great. Such a pleasure. Have a great day.